Well, this documentary recap is another Football Life episode. We've done a couple of these so far. This one actually takes us back to December 5th, 2014. That's when it, when it debuted. But the subject is Roger Staubach, one of the great quarterbacks of all time. Mike, it's a guy that our, our generation's not too familiar with, but I think people that are a little bit older than us cherish this guy. Dude, they do cherish this guy. You put it perfectly. He's like for a generation of football fans, he's like the guy. Yeah, absolutely. And we so, and there's a reason why. And we're going to go into some of that tonight on the show. Not to take anything away from it, but I think it's just funny. He's the guy that's always talked about it and we learned about some of those reasons why in this documentary. So, we'll run through all that tonight again. You can find us online distantreplaypodcast.com, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Please subscribe, like this video. Uh, all that stuff helps us out along the way. So, Roger Staubach. Mike, where, where, where should we even begin? Because it, this is not like the other football lives as much where it kind of started from very, very young, you know, and worked away all through the career. It really kind of it seemed like about a 20-year time frame. A little, I mean, it went longer towards the end, but it didn't have all the early stuff necessarily. No, it didn't. Probably because he's like one of the older subjects of a football life that we've that we've covered. Yeah. So maybe not a ton of people from his early childhood available to interview. It's probably my best guess, which is probably why I wasn't covered that much, but... I think where you started with Roger Staubach is how he became, how the lore of the nickname Captain America came to be, you know? Yeah. And to me, you know, it all started with him being the quarterback at Navy in a time period where, you know, Army, Navy football or, or you know, or uh, service academy football was still a very big deal in this country. And the, the marquee player, in this case, for Navy, Roger Staubach, and how he endeared himself to the country that way to start. Yeah, and, and look, I was familiar with that he went to Navy, very familiar with that, you know, knew of his career, knew how good he was. But I, to be honest with you, I don't know, I didn't know a whole lot else about him. Like, I, did, I, never, I never watched him play. I wasn't, I'd never really gone back and watched footage of him play. So a lot of this was new to me in terms of what kind of player he was, you know, his relationship on the Cowboys. And then even like this career with Navy, you know, the, the, the guy that was there, I guess now would be an SID, but they're chief communications person at Navy decided to actually run a Heisman campaign for the guy. And really at a time when they said in the documentary that it had never been done before. And I mean, I have no idea if that's true or not. I would imagine it is. I mean, you go back that far, there's probably not a ton of that. None, not, not a lot of PR campaigns, but I did like it because like they had pictures kind of told the story of him having a picture without his face mask on that probably a lot of people have seen before are familiar with, like on the cover of Time maybe and probably some other places. But that was this guy's idea to like to see his face and know who he is, the man behind, you know, inside the helmet. Yeah, well, ahead of his time. You'll see there's a lot of things in this documentary about Staubach that they cover that we know today. It's like a part of the lexicon. And the first thing is the Heisman Trophy campaign. Like they, they make it sound like it had never been done to this point. And they Navy made sure they got him on the cover of Sports Illustrated, of Time Magazine, you know, in order to showcase him. Mm -hmm. And they made sure at every point, like Ben just said, he didn't have a face mask on in pictures, things of that nature. And they, they painted him, not painted him, but he was a great teammate, thanked his teammates at every turn. Um, and, you know, this is kind of where, you know, the legend of Roger Staubach begins. And it was aided by this this Navy, you know, like we would call today, like Ben said, sports information department who started that uh, ball rolling. And to think he may, maybe not, wouldn't have gotten to the Navy um, on any other day taking the test where he took the eye test and had the colors mixed up, but the guy that was administering the test wasn't paying a whole lot of attention and passed him when he thought that he probably should have failed the test and may not have ended up in Navy anyway, which is crazy. That's an awesome little tidbit you get from from shows like this that you would never get because you got it right from Roger Staubach. I mean, could you imagine Roger Staubach not going to the Naval Academy? Yeah, like, right. I mean, come on. Pretty wild. But uh, he, he so he got drafted by the Cowboys. Someone wasn't in the documentary. We actually went back and looked because we were just kind of wanting some clarity. He was drafted as a future pick. Like he got drafted before he was a actually done at Navy because he had been out of school for four or been out of high school for four years. So they took a 10th round future selection on him, which is, I mean, I were you aware this even happened before? I was aware it happened in the NBA. Remember we went through Larry Bird, how he got drafted the yeah. year before he actually yeah. came out. Um, I was not aware it happened in the NFL. Yeah, brand news, brand new news to me and and you. But so this is the other part I didn't know about. So I didn't I didn't realize when he when he got done, he went and served for four years. And I I mean I just assumed he went and straight and played football as soon as he got done. But he went and served for four years. 
And what is, what's wild is this, this is how much this guy worked and put in time to his craft, which we learned about, but how much he loved football. He, he spent the time that he was on leave from the military at training camp with the Cowboys. Yeah, and, and, the cow, and they go through in this how, you know, that's when the Cowboys knew what they had in him was through these practices. And they showed some footage of those practices in this, which I thought was awesome. I did too. I, I had that in my notes as well. Yeah, and it, it's awesome because, number one, you got the Roger Staubach highlights with him running around, earning the nickname Roger the Dodger, which mm-hmm. is one of his nicknames. And the local reporter on site for these <laughs> for these practices was none other than Vern Lundquist. Vern's everywhere. So uh, Uncle Vern, the local Dallas reporter covering Roger Staubach's training camp practices, was awesome. Yeah, Vern, Vern's got a... He's got a long history with the Cowboys being the voice of the radio, uh, the Cowboys on the radio for a long time. But, uh, yeah, that was great to see him there. But a couple things about that practice footage. First thing was you see all the highlights in college, and you could tell he can scramble, right, and and run around. But I didn't really – I really couldn't see how good he was at that until these practice clips where he's going full speed against these these other NFL players. And and he's kind of weaving his way in and out. And the other part of that is that they weren't – it's not like today – where the quarterback's wearing a black jersey or a different color yeah, jersey because they can't be right. hit, they were crushing him. Yeah, and and yeah, and and he's and he's doing it, and we'll get into his relationship with um, Landry a little bit later. But he's doing it. I don't want to say against Landry's wishes, but I think Landry wished he wasn't doing it, kind of thing. Yeah, and he's out there scrambling all around to the point where Gil Brandt is in this, the legendary personnel man uh, for the Cowboys, mm-hmm. and who says, "quote." He looked like Secretariat racing a bunch of plow horses. <laughs> so again, we're just coming off doing a three-part uh, docu- uh, three-part uh, triple crown series on Secretariat. So I wrote that down to mention. Yeah, that was great. But um, you know, he's in a situation where he eventually gets through his military service, and you know, this whole quarterback controversy, Ben, with uh, Craig Morton. Yeah. Um, I was not. The, the details of this were fuzzy to me. Is this something you knew about before this? No, I didn't. Go ahead. Go ahead. Tell. Go ahead. Uh, update us. Yeah. So he, he comes. He comes from his military service. Uh, he's behind Craig Morton. Craig Morton leads the Cowboys to a Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. Okay. They choose in 1971. This basically comes down to a decision after trying to do like a, uh, you know, a, a quarterback rotation type thing. Uh, Landry eventually says, "Hey, look, Staubach's going to be my quarterback." And his first year of starting was 1971, and the Cowboys won the Super Bowl. Staubach was the MVP. He was the first person ever to win the Heisman um, and the Super Bowl MVP. And I thought what was funny was after they won, they gave the, the they gave the uh, MVP a car, and he could have got like a sporty Dodge Charger, right? But instead, he asked for a station wagon because he already has three kids. <laughs> and this just further like, you know, contributes to like the every man Captain America you know, Navy quarterback, Heisman winner kind of image, you know, and it is, and it's, you learn in this documentary, it's not really like a painted image. It's really how he is like a very genuine person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it really, it really, he seems like a really, a, a, like by all accounts, like everybody that talked about him was, he is a, a sincere, authentic, good hearted, just true person, which is awesome to hear about. Cause he's like, that's, this is always hard to find in general with a person especially somebody that enjoys a high level of success and then even more so an athlete, right? A quarterback, um, pretty hard to find, but he was that person. I, 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 I can't believe that he almost, he didn't play until he was 29. Like I had to stop and go back and, and hear that part of this conversation where he was basically like, listen, coach, you gotta, you gotta do, you, you gotta make a decision, right? I, I, you might need to trade me. I, I need a chance to play. I'm, I'm almost, I mean, I'm almost, my career's almost done here. Like almost out of time. And the fact that he didn't play until he's 29 and still had the career he did, Mike, because I know now a like, guy's almost 30. You're like, okay, how many years does he have left in this contract? Right. Forget Tom Brady, but just in general for a football player, you're like, okay, so he's 30. I mean, quarterbacks do go a little bit longer in general, but still to begin your career at that point, I mean, I had no clue. Yeah, and I, and I and I got the feeling that, you know, when he approached Landry with this, that this sort of started like, I don't want to say a bad relationship between him and Landry because I don't think that's what it was, but kind of like an odd relationship. Not really a relationship you would expect with really good coach, really good quarterback, you know. Um, sort of like, a, I think the best way to put it is a little bit of a, of a strained relationship between the two, but they both made it work, obviously, in a very successful way. I mean, they reached four conference championship games. 
They won two Super Bowls together. So, I mean, no, the, sorry, they won four conference championships and won two Super Bowls together. So it obviously worked, but I thought that was interesting and in that's how they explained the relationship between the two and how unique it was. I was, yeah, I was, I was kind of, after hearing, after watching this episode, I kind of want to learn more about Landry because it kind of felt like, I mean, I, I obviously a very brilliant guy and thought about as being one of the top coaches, but the way like it was described is almost like he, he was lucky that Staubach kind of took some things on his own, right? Like oftentimes Staubach would just kind of run, run his, not, not run his own offense, but would kind of do things his own way, including like in the Super Bowl when he threw a touchdown pass to, uh, you probably remember who it was. I don't, I can't remember off the top of my head, but threw a touchdown pass to a guy down the center of the field and Landry got pissed because he was supposed to be running an out pattern. And instead, like of, of celebrating the fact that they just they just scored a touchdown in the Super Bowl and ended up winning that game, he was just he, he was much more focused on the actual execution of his game plan more so than the player. So almost like does Landry get too much credit for what he did? Like is a guy like Staubach kind of kind of I won't say carry him, but improve his legacy because he he was so good and overcame what Landry's maybe deficiencies were. Yeah, but when it came down to it, though, Ben, you know, Landry never won a Super Bowl without Staubach. You know. Hey, I was gonna, I, I was gonna say it, but you did, you did. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not telling you, you know, I we weren't around to see Tom Landry, you know what I mean? So, I mean, I know he's a legend, obviously, but he was consumed with the process, you know. Yeah. Um, and it's a football, it's a term we hear a lot in football now, you know. It's kind of played out, but it made it sound like he was like really the first one to really like put a name to it and believe in his system. And I think he might have thought that, hey, look, I could plug anyone into this system and it'd be really good. Um, and I think what the situation was that Staubach played within his system most of the time, but then when he needed to improvise and make things happen, he also did that as well. You know, yeah. and I think that's what that that's what might have caused the strain relationship because wasn't there a time period where he took the play calling duties away from Roger Staubach? Yeah, when, when Staubach lost his mom, uh, and his mom was really sick. He's like, "You got a lot going on. I know, I know you're really distracted. So let me just make it easy for you. I'll call the plays, and you just go out there and and just and just execute. I know there's a lot on your mind." And, and yeah. Staubach made it seem like this is his way of, of trying to be like, hey, I'm, I am I need to take control of this offense again. It, it didn't matter. He just found the right excuse at the right time to say that. Yeah, and Star, you're right. Staubach directly said this in, in, in this uh, in this documentary, which I thought was a pretty powerful part of it. Um, so, I, again, like I said, the relationship worked. They won over the years, but just a little bit of a strange relationship. What about some of these people in this documentary, Ben, that like just revered Roger Staubach? I mean, I, I couldn't believe like, it was like a who's who. Yeah, he was. I mean, yeah, he was well thought of by a ton of people and, and for good reason. I mean, he did a lot of good in his time. Yeah. Chris Christie, the yeah. former governor of New Jersey, which I knew he's a huge Cowboys fan because he's on WFAN a lot. So okay. I, I already knew that. But Steve Young, he was his idol. John Elway, he was his idol. His teammates like absolutely loved him. Mm -hmm. Thomas Henderson, Thomas Hollywood Henderson tells the story of how when he was down and out in rehab, you know, Staubach called him and, and said, hey, look, Thomas, you've always been a good guy. You're a good guy. You'll get through this. And Thomas Henderson was like, you know what? No one ever told me I was a good guy. I didn't know I was a good guy. And, like, you know, he, he did that for me. And he gave, like, countless teammates jobs when they were struggling. Told yeah. one guy that was going through some stuff, like, hey, look, you don't even have to come to the office if you don't want. I'll give you a salary. Yeah, he lost like, his 18-year-old son. Yeah, that died, that died in his sleep. But yeah, he was like, "Listen, I know, I know you're going through it a lot right now." And the guy said, "I was, I was out of it, just completely out of it." And he said, "Listen, you're moving to Dallas, you know, right? Well, well, I got a job for you, an office for you, salary. You don't have to show up. Like, yeah, I just want to make sure you're taken care of, uh, because otherwise, who knows what'll happen?" But there are these countless stories of that type of thing where he just he was selfless, right? And, and a lot of times they they mentioned it was just done. You know, without anybody knowing, he just took care of people that were close to him that knew and needed that help. Yeah, it, it's just it, 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 to hear the story. You have to watch it to hear the stories. There, there's a lot of them, and and they're like each one of them is unique. And he signed all his own autographs, responded to all his own, his fan mail. Yeah. So someone like if someone, <laughs> this is wild. Like if someone contacted him about like some kind of advice they needed, he would like write them a response. Yeah, like every single one. Yeah. Um, you know, just, just a very, very unique guy. And obviously on the football field, you know, he, the, from 69 to 79, you know, that was his era, 23, four, 23, fourth quarter comeback victories. Um, the term hail Mary yeah, comes from, yeah. 
Roger Staubach when he threw the pass to Drew Pearson to win the game in the 1975 divisional round versus the Vikings. You know, they asked him how he did it, and he said, I think he said, I said a couple Hail Hail Marys before I threw the ball. Yeah. And that that term was was coined right then and there. Um, So, you know, and and even like Ben, like Rolades. Like when I think of Rolades, I think of Rolades spells relief. Yeah. You know, and he's one of the first athletes in those commercials selling, saying, you know, you spell, uh, you know, Rolades spells relief, you know? Yeah. So it's just a, a guy who, like, I, like, he reminds me, Ben, around here of, like, Yankee fans who they still talk about Mickey Mantle like he retired last week because <laughs> he was their guy. You know what I mean? There's a certain yeah. era. I think if you're a certain era football fan, you, you know, you have Roger Staubach, America's team, Captain America. I also think this is the time period, Ben, where people started to not like the Cowboys. Probably, yeah. Because it's like, hey, the Cowboys are perfect. You got Tom Landry in the hat, Captain America, America's team. Mm-hmm. And they, they capture a little bit of that in this as well, which I thought was good. That was good. And and speaking of commercials, you you mentioned to me, another guy caught your eye. All right. Yeah. So (laughs) Ben's been setting me up here and I I didn't know if I wanted to talk about it or not, but (laughs) so his center, the guy who played center, the center position at Navy was Thomas Lynch. And you may say who's Thomas Lynch and, and why am I mentioning him? If you've ever seen the new day USA loan commercials, they're basically like loans for people who have served in the military. Yeah. This Thomas Lynch is like the spokesman for it. <laughs> and he's in all the commercials. And if you know what I'm talking about, you're going to think this is really funny. If you don't know, you're going to think I'm an idiot. Yeah. But I had to say it. And he actually worked for Staubach later after, you know, when they were older at his real estate business. And then this Thomas Lynch now goes on to New Day USA and is in all these commercials. But I just thought that was hilarious. Again, it's one of those things. If you know, you know, if you don't, Right, you probably, probably already shut this off. Yeah, you're like, what are you talking about? But yeah, that, that's <laughs> hilarious. Um, that's good. A couple other notes from the documentary that I enjoyed. The story about the like, he had they had his five children on, which is great. They gave some great great insight into him as a dad and, and just kind of what he's known for. But it was great to hear the Phyllis George interview. They 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 had a clip from. Classic. And I guess because the story, right, Mike, was that he was getting compared to Namath a lot, but everybody would just say, well, hey, well, Namath. You know, similar quarterbacks, but Namath likes to have a good time. Namath, you know, Namath has a different image. Yeah, and you, on the meanwhile, Roger, you're, you know, you're buttoned up. You, you know, you're married. You just, you're quiet. You're, you're a homebody. Whatever else. And his quote, it was, I've never seen this clip before. He said, well, I, I enjoy having sex too. I just like to do it with one woman. <laughs> was well, a great quote. Yeah, it really was. And the, and they taught. I, I had seen that clip before. And, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it, it's, one, it's one of those, and that's another thing they talk about in this is, is just his family, how solid his family life is with the five kids, yeah. with his wife he's been with forever. You know, it almost seems like he's just like, you know, the perfect guy, you know? Yeah, and his son, his son looks just like it. Too. Yeah, he really does. And what me and Ben haven't mentioned yet, so we went through his military service, great family man, you know, great football player. We haven't mentioned the fact yet that this guy started a real estate business <laughs> that he sold for six hundred million dollars in two thousand seven. When they said that, they said the amount, I could not <laughs> believe it. My jaw hit the floor. So he literally did, has done everything. Six hundred million dollars commercial real estate business. He sold at the height of everything, right? Because if, if anyone yeah. knows anything about real estate, listening to this, two thousand seven was yeah. literally like right before the bubble burst. Yeah. Wow. I didn't even think about that one. But yeah, that's a great point. The other thing from this documentary, uh, back to his playing career quickly, Clint Longley. I don't know if anybody, I don't know if that name is familiar to anybody listening, if you haven't seen this documentary, but I had not. And they tell a story, another quarterback kind of battling for time at the Cowboys. They got into an argument, he and Staubach, during one of the practices. And, they, and they got, his teammates telling the story, didn't really remember what it was about. You know, probably something happened on the field to play, whatever. Uh, and, and it spilled over to the locker room and and it sounded like Staubach kind of gave him the business, having his military background, like worked him over pretty good, it sounded like, right? And then the next day he shows up and just waiting to catch Staubach off guard and just sucker punched him and ran, like literally ran and left the facility and never came back. <laughs> That's <laughs> one this, of the craziest stories in football I've ever heard. And Staubach uh, like had a big gash above his eye because he yeah. fell and like hit a table or something, yeah, a right? Scale, they said? Yeah, scale. a scale. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh man, yeah. could you imagine punching Roger Staubach in the locker room? You know, during that era with the Cowboys. 
I mean, the reputation that he had. I, I looked him up. Yeah. But the re- reputation that he carried. This is the big, very beginning of his career too. He got he got drafted in 1974. So this is literally the very beginning of his career. He 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 got traded to San Diego, played there for a year, then was off to Canada and. He played a couple of years after that, and that was it, which, you know, no surprise. But, I mean, I, I, I can't imagine. I mean, even if you are – I don't know. That's That story to me, there's just a lot of that, that story that I just could not believe that that, that that would actually happen. But everybody told the story, and I it's on his Wikipedia. Like, I went and looked it up. And like, there is – in his Wikipedia, there is a section called the Stallback Incident. And, and every – they interviewed about three different teammates, and they all told the same exact story. You know, that's how you know it's like a real genuine story. Yeah. And I can't imagine if that guy had not run out of the locker room, forget about Staubach getting up and beating him up. All, everyone on the team would have. Yeah, right. But Jed, that was a wild story. I mean, and, and it, look, multiple teammates and ex, ex coaches of his flat out say, like, he saved my life. Yeah. Like, that's the kind of guy we're dealing with here. So just a very interesting football life. He's lived a great life. I mean, he's still living his life, but, you know, he's, he's lived a great life. And, um, yeah, just a, uh, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add, but it's just, it just, it took me back about how like, he, he's, he's truly a chip off the old block. Yeah, he is. And he was smart enough to walk away from football too, before things got too bad after having a couple of yeah. concussions and um, knew that it was going to be bad as doctor, you know, recommended that. And he, he followed through with it, which I'm, I'm sure he's glad he did because look how much success he's had since then. But yeah, a pretty remarkable guy. And another thing, Ben, is that he, you know, He's thinking about retiring after the 79 season because of the concussions, and Landry doesn't even try to talk him out of it. Yeah, Landry. Because he has Danny White wait, waiting in the wings. Cowboys went to three straight NFC Championship games after Staubach retired, but they never won another Super Bowl. Yeah, I need to look they up Tom. Won. I need to look up Tom Landry because I, I I left this documentary. That was one of the biggest things going. Like, what if Staubach was never his quarterback? Would Tom? I mean, would Tom Landry be one of the most overrated coaches of all time? I, and I might be speaking out of turn, but that's what I left here wondering. Because of the, like the way that their relationship was and how Staubach kind of basically overcame what the system that Landry was trying to have him run and then won two Super Bowls. So I don't know. Yeah, a lot of these older coaches that are around for a really long time, um, I just think it's a matter of like if you're around for 30 years, like you're probably just not going to be really good for 30 years straight. Yeah. You know what I mean? I just think they have ebbs and flows like every other coach would for 30 years. But but their legend is so big that those, you know, five, six, seven, eight years they weren't that good, that their teams weren't that good or never focused on, you know? Yeah. Uh, one note I want to end on here, um, one last note on Longley, in his Wikipedia page, you'll enjoy this because I know you're a big NFL fan, uh, films guy, but he, so number one, he earned the nickname Mad Bomber in his rookie training camp because he threw one of his errant passes, hit, Tom Landry's coaching tower. That's how, I guess, how inaccurate he was. Mm-hmm. But the NFL Network did a top 10 one-hit wonders list, yeah. and Longley was on it. Steve Sable said he last heard that Longley had ended up selling carpet remnants out of the back of a van in Marfa, Texas. <laughs> wow. And have I? are you trying to ask if I've ever bought carpet from a guy who had remnants in his van? I, I wasn't going to ask that. but I Never bought remnants, but I bought from a guy who had – you know, he had one of those white vans, and he'd open and have all the patterns there. And whatever you picked, he just took it right out of the van and went and installed it. I've done that before. Of course you yeah. have. But uh, and what about a coaching tower, huh? Yeah. Those things still around? You know, you know, Bear Bryant had a coaching tower. Bro, the coaching I don't tower is still at the practice field. Come on, <laughs> is it really? Is yeah. that a joke or no? No, it's there. Yeah. <laughs> of course, it's still there. Come on, dude. I love. We have to do a whole episode on like traditional sec football stuff and you could just say whatever it is and i'll just laugh yeah, I know. You'll, and you'll believe it too probably yeah I, no i'll believe what. anything you say yeah <laughs> all right let's close it out mike a good good documentary uh roger straw back great guy really really glad I, I learned more about him because i've heard i know all about him but i don't know a lot of these details and they feel you on a lot of it but great dude um i'm glad he's, he's still around probably still making a difference in a lot of people's lives and he, and, and and we even mentioned the fact that all these guys said that he could probably be the president if he wanted to and they didn't even talk about that side of it which yeah um, everyone's like surprised he didn't get into politics because yeah. he could have been really successful it's like hey you want to go into politics or you want to make 600 mil in real estate yeah you know? if he didn't if he would have waited 2008 to sell that that real estate business he might have gone into politics instead he said he, if he needed a job he might have done it but anyway we'll close it out on that note please subscribe like the video we appreciate you listening to the show as always if you ever have any recommendations on games documentaries or true crime subjects please let us know we do appreciate it yep like subscribe do everything rate 
do whatever you need to do, please. It helps us a lot. And until next time.